Good morning. Thank you for joining us for National Curriculum for School Mental Health Overview by the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Now I'd like to introduce the speakers. Shana Clayson, Statewide Behavioral Health Consultant and Victoria Wah-Reed, Statewide Youth uh, Suicide Prevention Coordinator with the New Mexico Department of Health Office of School and Adolescent Health. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Really happy to be here with you all. Um, again, my name is Shana Clausen. I'm the Statewide Behavioral Health Consultant with the Office of School and Adolescent Health. And I think Victoria is going to share our slides. Thank you. Um, some of you may be familiar with our office. Again, we work for the New Mexico Department of Health, Office of School and Adolescent Health. Like I said, I am statewide, but I wanted to let you all know and really hope we've got folks from all over the state here. We have staff all over all of the state, both centralized and regionally. And so you can see here on the map who your school mental health advocate is, who your school health advocate is. And if you have any questions or need any help accessing any one of us, um, please let me know you have our contact information. So today we're going to be talking about the behavioral health curriculum put out by the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. We work very closely with the Mental Health Technology Trans Transfer Center, which is a national organization. We are part of the South Southwest region, uh, which includes Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and I think I might be forgetting one, Arkansas. Um, so within the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, there's a variety of different resources. And one of those ma major resources is the curriculum that we're going to be talking about today. So the purpose of the Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers is to develop and strengthen specialized behavioral health care workforce and provide mental health prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. Um, they also help people and organizations incorporate practices in the mental health disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, you can see here all of the different locations of the mental health technology transfer centers. You see the there in purple in the South Southwest region. I really encourage you all to go to their websites, look at the different resources they have, and visit all of the different resource centers throughout the nation. They all have a variety of different resources that anybody has access to. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick poll. So we wanna hear from you all, and a poll should be popping up on your screen right now, to tell us your role within schools or working with youth. So we'll give you just a couple minutes. Okay, great. So thank you all for doing that. It looks like we've got our biggest chunk of folks um, identifying as school mental health professionals at 38%. We've got some school nurses, uh, some community health providers, some teachers, and the other category. That's wonderful. Thank you all so much for participating in that. Okay, so what we're going over today, like I stated, was the curriculum for behavioral health. When we use the word curriculum, sometimes that can be a little confusing, especially for school folks, because we think, okay, it's one more thing that we're going to bring in to teach the kids. With this, I want you to think about it a little more as a framework. This is an overarching umbrella of how to implement effective behavioral health within your school. And I want to use the word again, effective and comprehensive school mental and behavioral health. So this is a framework that fits in with everything you're already doing and making it all talk together and link together. What we're going to go over today is module one of that framework, and that's really to introduce you to what the framework is, what its purpose is, and what ties everything together. Statement here, I'll let you all read that for just a second. And another statement there, I'll let you all read. Thank you. So our agenda today we're going to go over the curriculum overview and who that target audience is for this curriculum, who's going to be involved within implementing the framework and where. We're also going to look at alignment with school mental health quality assessment. Assessment is huge. We need to know where we're starting out from and we need to be able to measure our successes in that and where we want, how we want to get to our goals. We're going to go over what comprehensive school mental health is, which I'm sure a lot of you all for, are familiar with, but again, it's a good refresher, the core features of the curriculum, the value, and then we're going to look at some district examples who have implemented this framework and what it looks like for them. And then if we have time, we'll do a little activity and then an evaluation at the end. Okay, so 
The National School Mental Health Curriculum was co-developed by the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network and the National Center for School Mental Health. So within the development of the National School Mental Health Center and the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, they together developed this national framework and curriculum. And therefore, then it was put out through the Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers across the nation. Next slide. And again, um, you'll see here on the map on the next slide, all of those different locations. The Mental Health Technology Transfer Centers was established in 2018 with funding from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. We've got 10 regional centers. Um, and then within our regional centers nationwide, we also have our National Hispanic and Latino Center, the National American Indian and Alaska, Alaska Native Center, and the Network Coordinating Office. Um, the National Center for School Mental Health, based at the University of Maryland, was established in 1985. Um, they had funding from the Health Resource and Services Administration. Their mission is to strengthen policies and programs regarding school mental health and improve learning and promote success for, for the youth of America. I'm going to take a second here and stop and look at the curriculum overview. So when we talk about the, the mental health curriculum, it has eight modules total. We're going over the foundations module today, which is module one. You can see the following eight modules are all based into different topics, from teaming to needs assessment, resource mapping, screening, mental health promotion for all, which is those tier one services, early intervention, which is tier two and tier three, funding and sustainability, which we all know is incredibly important, and then measuring our impact. Um, within those curriculums, you are gonna go one by one, but please remember this is not a linear process. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, one, another thing that is incredibly important to talk about, especially right now, is that this curriculum is free. This doesn't cost you anything. And I think a link will be provided to you in the chat box here in just a moment. Um, but again, just to remind you that this is a free curriculum and you have access to assess it at any point in time. Our role at OSA is to be coaches. Um, if you wanna go through this yourself, that's absolutely up to you to do. If you want help trying to figure out where do we start, where do we go next and which one do we do first, that's our role here at OSA to be able to help you do. So who are the target audience? Um, within the target audience, we look at district team members that can influence, develop, and oversee school mental health systems at the school district and building levels. There's a variety of different folks who could be involved in this, from district leaders to admins, like principals, assistant principals, district mental health director, um, community behavioral health agency that you may contract with or you all refer to, and a youth and family advocate or consumer. It's extremely important to have an interdisciplinary group. We all come from different roles, depending on where we sit within the school, whether we're sitting with the district or the school level, or I'm a teacher or an administrator, or whoever I am, I have a different focus, right? So it's important to have a team that's interdisciplinary that can all come together and be representative from each area to start looking at this framework. So on the next slide, we're gonna do another poll. So who do you think you have the ability to influence? So from the position of where you sit within your school, think about who do I have the ability to influence? So when I go back to my district and I say, I wanna implement this. All right, great. So we have 30% saying that they feel that they have the ability to influence their school district leaders, like the superintendent, the school board. 75% say they have the ability to influence school administration. That's wonderful, your principals. 35% district mental health directors, 25% community behavioral health agency, and 60% youth and family advocate or consumer. That's wonderful. I, I wanna remind you all on the purpose of this is we hear a lot from schools, oh, well, I'm a teacher, you know, I don't really get to make the decisions or, you know, I'm a counselor, it's not my role to decide what policy and procedures are in place. It is your role, absolutely. And from wherever you sit within that level of the school or district or whatever it is, you absolutely do have the ability to influence policy and procedures and curriculums and frameworks that are implemented within your district or school. And again, we're here to support you in that in any way that we can. So let's talk about some best practices. Each of these modules aligns with the national performance domain indicators of comprehensive school mental health 
system quality. You may be familiar with these domains, um, you may not, but when you saw um, the slide that went over all the different modules, those are the domain indicators. These domains and indicators were established as part of, as part of the National Quality Initiative on School Mental Health and were developed through a process led by the National Center of School Mental Health with a diverse stakeholder input from the field. All of these domains and indicators are part of the school mental health quality assessment, okay? Um, this is part of a quality assessment tool that you all can complete and looks and gives you those results based on those quality indicators. Many of these quality indicators include best practice guidelines that can be used to self-assess and implement according to the guide in strategic quality improvement planning. We want to know where we're at, we want to know where our goal is, and we want to measure our process of implementation. Quality indicators are loaded by the tab on the upper left corner of the slides within each model, module. So you'll see that purple box on the top left side of the slide. That's going to indicate which improvement indicator we're talking about at that time. Okay. So overview of school mental health quality domain indicators. Again, you have the seven quality indicators listed up there on the screen for you. Teaming, needs assessment, resource mapping, mental health promotion, which we talked about, which is level tier one services, tier two and tier three, which is early intervention and treatment and supports, screening, impact, and funding and sustainability. Each module, when you go through this curriculum, contains resources as indicated by the resource tab on the top right of the screen. So now you'll see that purple box on the top right. So if you wanna know what quality of domain indicator you're on, top left, what resources on the top right. Many of these resources are included at the end of the module. So you go through and say, you know, we're talking about teaming. Okay, great, that's our quality indicator. We know what we're doing, but what does that actually look like? How can I implement that? You'll see that those list of resources but on the top right at the end of the slide deck. The resources most of the time provide an overview of the school mental health quality domains and indicators and how that implementation looks. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we call the SHAPE system. So when we talk about evaluation, it's extremely important. And like we said before, we want to know where we're starting with and what we're doing really well. Within this framework, we're not asking you to throw out everything you've done within your school or district regarding mental and behavioral health services. What we wanna do is take what you have and evaluate it, see what's working well, see what not, may not be working so well, and make them all talk to each other and fit in together. So within the SHAPE system, SHAPE align, this SHAPE assessment aligns directly with the curriculum. Um, within that assessment, that group, that remember a couple of slides ago, we talked about putting that interdisciplinary team together. Within that inter interdisciplinary team, you all can go in and complete the shape assessment. This can be at the district level, or this could be at the school level. When you go through and com complete the shape assessment, it's gonna ask what you have going on within your school, and as you go through each one of those quality domain indicators. Um, if you forgot something, that's okay. It's something you can go back in and go, oh, hold on, wait a second. It says we didn't do so good in this area, but we have this, this, and this. You can go back in and implement it. When it spits out the assessment, that assessment is automatically in line within those quality domain indicators. So say, for example, funding and sustainability. That's an area within your school that you'd really like to work on, right? Like we said, within this curriculum, it's not linear. So if that's something that jumps out to your school or district, that's where you can start. So within the SHAPE assessment, the SHAPE was developed by the National Center for School Mental Health in partnership with the field to increase quality, sustainability of comprehensive school mental health. It also houses the National School Mental Health Census and the National School Mental Health Quality Assessment. Within the SHAPE system, and we're gonna go on to the next slide, we'll talk about its resource library as well. So this is an example of the assessment and reports. So when you go in, you'll create an account for your district or your school and the accounts are free. This is all free, nobody's asking you to pay for anything, right? The accounts are free. So when you go in, you'll create your assessment. SHAPE has several features to support districts and school teams, including school and district profiles and quality assessment targeted resources. Those school and district profiles collect information and provide a snapshot of the multi-tiered services of supports, staffing, finance, data systems of your school and district's comprehensive school mental health system. 
and then that report. So the quality assessment and individualized reports offer you all within your school or district the opportunity to complete that assessment and receive a tailored report that illustrates the, de the degree of implementation from emerging all the way to mastery. Individualized reports then provide guidance on strategic quality improvement plans. So like we said, if you know, financing and sustainability is an area where you're not quite at mastery yet, what do you do? It gives you the step-by-step -step of what to do next. Uh, the shape also hosts district and state dashboards. So we can see from a state level where the district sits, if you're doing this at the school level, and where we sit as a state. This information may guide state and district technical assistance and quality improvement support efforts. We use those district shape assessments to be able to look at a state level, where we're at as a state, who's completed this, who hasn't completed it, and where we sit and where we can continue to help and support our schools across the state. Next slide. The system also provides individuals and teams with quality improvement guides and resources. All of the resources in here are all best practices or evidence-based practices. Um, we really push that within the Department of Health, within the state, alongside of the governor's initiatives regarding evidence-based practices. We wanna make sure what we're implementing, we know works, right? Um, the report that is generated after the completion will align directly with these resources available. So again, let's say funding and sustainability, when you go to the resource library, it's categorized just along with those quality indicators. So when you go to the funding and sustainability, there is a wealth of resources, all evidence-based, all best practices that you can go through and figure out what fits best to implement within your school or district. Uh, in addition to the quality improvements, SHAPE also offers additional tools, including the screening and assessment library, um, and which also the, is in line with the trauma responsive schools assessment, which is also in there as well. So maybe you don't have a evidence-based assessment that you use or any ass uh, assessment that you use. There's a variety of different ones in there. Um, the screening and assessment library provides information about all of the links to these free, yes, free assessment measures that can be used within school mental health. The library allows you can filter based on focus area or assessment purpose, age, language, reporter, or cost. Um, we also have the Trauma Responsive Schools Implementation Guide, which also sits within there, and that's another evidence-informed tool to assess trauma responsiveness of the district or the school. It's comprised of those same eight domains and was co-developed with the National Traumatic Stress Network Treatment and Services Adaptation Center for Resilience, Hope, and Wellness in Schools in partnership with the NCSMH. So we all like recognition, right? So when we go through and complete that SHAPE assessment, the district and school teams can, ach can achieve recognition that's seen across your district and your state when they complete this curriculum. Um, recognition may increase opportunities for federal, state, or local grant funding. So again, funding and sustainability, if that's an area that you're really working on and you get that bronze, silver, or gold medal, gold, sta gold star status, that can be something that you can say, hey, look, I'm proving a need here or look what we've done. And this again can really help with funding opportunities or, ver or a variety of other things. All right, we got another poll here. So has your school or district utilized an evaluation tool to assess its school mental health services in the past three years. So we have 25% saying yes, they have, and 75% saying no, they have not. Thank you so much for participating in that. A couple of things to think about really briefly. Um, some key recommendations from the equity and mental health framework include a variety of different things, but identifying and promoting the mental health and well being of students as a district priority. Part of doing that is saying, yes, we all agree that this is a priority and we want to work towards it. Assessment is extremely important in that process because how can we measure success when we don't know where we're starting off with? And we will pass it off to Victoria. Good morning, everyone. So just to recap, we're talking about free, um, evidence-based way to assess comprehensive school mental health for a building for an entire district. So um, that is just kind of gold. Um, funny that there's a gold star. We are working with one school that has achieved gold star status and a district that's achieved bronze star status. So it can be done for sure. 
And it's very helpful information. The reports that are generated are so detailed, so highly detailed and broken down. And then as a team, you can decide what you want to do with the report. So for those of you that are doing all these great things, but don't really know how to quantify it or wrap your arms around your entire school or your entire district and want to figure out a way to show what you're already doing, because we're not suggesting at all that you stop doing what you're doing. Um, it would be great to be able to show others and to show the information for yourself what you are doing and then where there's some areas for improvement or maybe there's a, a hidden blind spot that you have. You need to fill in a hole that you didn't really realize, hey, we don't really have that covered. I know for a lot of, a lot of us here in New Mexico, sometimes that blind spot is that our funding is fleeting. Our funding is temporary. It's, it's grant-based. Uh, we're involved in pilot programs maybe, just as an example. Um, which I've been on the receiving end of that myself for many, many different years. Uh, we have a great program, we're making a huge impact and we're filling this void, but we know our funding ends in four or five years or two years. And then we have to figure something else out again. And maybe that is kind of a blind spot that needs improvement, but it just depends. Um, maybe it's staffing. I, I'm not sure anybody that says staffing is not a problem for our school mental health. So um, again, this is, this is free and it's evidence-based and we are here to, to to sell it to you for free. So um, to, to go through a little bit more here um, of, and how this looks at comprehensive school mental health, we wanna, we wanna you know, they, they define it and there are quality indicators and that's what you get measured on basically. But um, this is talking about a system and it's not just one person's effort, um, one school mental health professional and they have to do all this stuff. Um, if this is a team-based, SHAPE system is a team-based activity to fill out all the questions. It's lengthy, it's comprehensive, um, and it, it talks about all of the inputs into your district or your school that everybody's working on because everybody is working towards school, comprehensive school mental health, not just mental health professionals in a, in a school. So it takes a look at that and um, it addresses the social and emotional learning factors, and like I said, it even addresses things like funding that we maybe aren't real comfortable talking about or maybe is not your expertise if you're a school mental health professional, but is vital to your existence and what you're doing. So it looks at all of that. Um, and as, as we go along and, you know, um, Secretary Stewart talked about SEL, talked about community schools, talked about behavioral health, linking all those things together, right, um, to make for a wraparound type of service in schools across our state. In order to do that, we need to know where we started, we need to measure that, and then we need to figure out where we're going. And the SHAPE system, which is through this MHTTC model um, and framework and curriculum is really, I would say hands down, probably your best way to measure that. Um, and I think Shane probably mentioned this already addressed you can fill out the shape assessment and you can come back three months later and say, I don't think we answered. You can fill it out as many times as you want and you can use it as a measurement or you can say we have somebody else on board to talk about the inputs into the system. So it's, um, it's a working document and you don't have to Report it to anybody if you don't want to. Uh, some folks can find this and now this is what we're gonna do about it. And some people wanna hold on to that, especially individual schools we found. They kinda of wanna keep that and hold on to it, make decisions and then fill it out again. And it's not something that they want to necessarily broadcast far and wide. Um, and you can do it that way too. It, in, in, a, in a district, um, we're working with a small district that's doing it at, at the district level. So um, it does have that flexibility for you. Core features of a comprehensive school mental health system. So um, I don't want to read these to you, but some of these look um, probably familiar to you. But um, these are the features that are, are measured and looked at in the SHAPE system. When you, and we'll keep referring back to that over and over again. But I want a lot of you to take a look there at that third major bullet, which is multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and then in some instances, that's called multi-level or multi-layered systems of support. And um, a lot of times we talk about that in, in reference to maybe special education eligibility, um, special education testing. 
But when we talk about something like tier one, two, and three for um, English language arts and the interventions that might be provided, when we talk about tier one or level one, we're talking about universal, all students receive fill in the blank, right? So for mental health, school mental health, um, a lot of what we see is layer level or tier two or three. And we target very specific students or very specific student groups. And what we haven't necessarily done an amazing job at is that first layer of that pyramid, right? That bottom layer that says every single student will receive what? Is it problem solving? Um, some, um, some folks do some really great domestic violence prevention curriculum and everybody in the whole high school received that. I would be on that first layer. But what else are we doing at every single grade level that all students receive that could be classified as school mental health? Are we talking about problem solving? And don't get me wrong, some schools are doing a, a really awesome job of providing something um, but are they providing every category of what they need? Do they have the staff they need to do that? Again, that's a huge issue, right? Staffing. So um, we really need to look at that pyramid that we all know so very well and think of it and to situate that within school mental health. What do all students get? We don't currently, and my hope someday is that we would have standards and benchmarks for school behavioral health. We don't have them right now, but you can create your own and say, what is it? what's pertinent in my school? What do I want to teach every single, grade, every single student in that grade level about mental health, um, problem solving, regulation, um, social emotional learning, where does that fit in? Because that's a huge component to the MHTTC curriculum and framework and is measured, of course, by the SHAPE system. So um, again, all of these data-driven decision-making, all of this is based on evidence-based practices and programs and assessment, rather than that struggle to say, I'm, I'm alone, um, I, maybe I'm in a rural school district, I'm the only one that's responsible for doing this, and I just had to make up my own assessment because it's the best I could do. And that's great, you're working so hard. What I'm telling you is, this system provides a lot, not all, all of the resources are free, but a lot of them are free. And you can just look up and say, I don't feel good about my assessment source library after you, um, what you want to use for whatever it is you'd like to assess specifically. And you can implement some evidence-based practices and you, you know, use that data-driven decision-making rather than just working as hard as you can by yourself. Instruction support to this. Um, there are people who are obviously, some schools have that and some schools don't. Some have part-time um, contractors, full-time. Some people have a team of mental health professionals at their school. There's everything in between, but everybody does contribute to that because when we talk about integrated school health, that means health and mental health. So we also talk about our, our nurses and our health assistants. Um, all of our staff can contribute just in the same way um, all staff contribute to literacy typically, right? We really do. So in that respect, what does all staff contribute to comprehensive school mental health? So that should be something you, you want to look at back to that pyramid of what everybody's doing on that first layer as well as the second and third layers. Um, some of us have the ability to use community partners. Some folks, depending on where they're at, don't have very many community partners, or you're in one of the, every single one of our counties that has a mental health provider shortage. And so maybe you, you don't have anybody to partner with, but you can partner with um, organizations, hospitals, clinics, anybody that could provide some sort of support, even if maybe that's funding and they don't provide clinical services necessarily. So um, it, it asks you to look at that in a strategic way and, and becoming a more community-based school rather than trying to function all on your own. So Claude, these are you know, some of the main stakeholders, right, that you're gonna invite into figuring out how you're gonna provide comprehensive school mental health program. You, you of course need your youth voice with your students, um, their families, their caregivers, um, the schools, 
your, your community, we already talked about that. Policymakers, we want to get them involved. How can they help us? Right now we have a super supportive state government for uh, comprehensive school mental health. And I hope that you do locally as well. And with your, um, with your school board, you want to present to your school board, you want to pull your school board, get them on board, explain, hey, I was given this shape thing and this MHTTC thing, and it's a way we can you know, improve our school mental health. We'd like to use it and we'd like your support, even if you're not asking for funding, but it's explaining what you're doing to try to get your school board and your community on board. So some examples of those partnerships, maybe doing an advisory group. A lot of us are familiar with having to put together advisory groups. It's typically a requirement when you have a federal grant, right? So um, family-centered procedures, um, I'll let you read down the list there, but consider all the evaluation that we do, all the things that we like to put into place you, you know, sometimes we even put an entirely new curriculum into place and we don't notify families of that. Um, but they're very, very important people. So I would, I would say ideally, if you decided to adopt the end of shape assessment, that you would let your community know how you're evaluating yourself and, and maybe even make those results available in a, in a in a meeting, a school board meeting, something like that. Hey, this is what we're working on. Um, there's nothing to be ashamed of in assessing yourself. Um, so, you know, really consider that as, as you go forward if you decide you want to use this. I am hearing that I am super crackly and I am not really sure what to do about that, but if it gets too bad, somebody just interrupt me because I don't want to torture people with crackle. It's cutting in and out periodically, huh? Okay. Just, just pass it over or something, okay? Because my speaker's crackling also. Victoria, the chat box. If it gets really bad, so I'll, I'll jump in. You know. American school. Okay. So, you, um, so the American School Counseling Association, you also have the American Association of School Social Workers and School Social Worker Council, I think, um, and Mass, National Association of School Psychologists, ASCA, American School Counselor Association, have um, some models themselves and um, definitely want to embrace those because those are evidence-based as well. And those actually are a component that would fit into the MHTTC framework and curriculum because the MHTTC looks like at the entire school or the entire school district for comprehensive school mental health, where each one of those three groups, school psychs, social workers, and counselors, all three groups of whom I love to death um, and have been members of their organizations in the past, they, they are fulfilling their role within school mental health. So, um, School Counselor Association has the um, RAMP model recognized ASCA model program, and it brings in all the components of school counseling. And those, those components fit within the MHTTC curriculum and framework. They fit within a shape of assessment. And then there's even more to that because school counselors cannot be expected to fulfill every single piece, such as impact and funding to um, comprehensive school mental health. So they have comprehensive school counseling program and that is that piece and it's evidence-based and it's outstanding. And that's been around for, I think a little over 20 years now and they keep updating and it's awesome. That's a huge chunk of um, MHTTC frame, framework and what we're talking about. Again, we're not asking anybody to throw out what they're doing and start over again, but instead look at what they're doing, how to wrap your arms around measuring that and then deciding if you have any spots that you need to improve and what that should look like, and then providing a resource library to start helping you on that journey of how are we going to improve this. So I think those all really fit together really well. All right, so not enough time. Okay, um, we're going to actually have a couple other activities here shortly, but um, in the interest of making sure that we do end on time and you can get to your next session on time, we want to keep going. This is a huge, hairy thing, 
for a lot of us. Um, when Shana and I went to the training for this, it was in Maryland, I believe. And we spent about two days going through a binder that was about five inches thick of this program. And it just blew my mind. And that's after I've been a school counselor for 18 years. And I saw this and I thought, whoa, that's, that's huge. But it is definitely comprehensive. It's definitely evidence-based. It's kind of the answer for anybody that says, how do I know if I'm doing what I should be doing? What should it look like? Um, a lot of time and energy and funding is spent trying to make sure that we properly and appropriately in a timely way serve our students who are in special education um, or that have accommodation plans, rightfully so. And then, um, and I have a question in the chat box that's kind of to this point of, um, so we're supposed to do case management, we're supposed to do therapy, we're supposed to do prevention, we're supposed to do health promotion, mental health promotion. Where are we gonna get the people and the money to do that? Part of this model is figuring that out. How do we get the money to do that in a sustainable way? How, how many FTEs do we actually need? Do we know? We know what we would like to have. Um, how, do, how many do we need? What kind of ratios do we want? And what activities do we want that are evidence-based that would justify asking for those FTEs, for those positions? And who do we want those people to be? Um, that's, that answer is going to be different at every school and in every district. So um, I just want to encourage you not to get um, too overwhelmed with, with this MHTTC framework and curriculum and filling out the shape. They are absolutely meant to be tools to help and, and to identify where you should spend your time and where you should spend your money and, and maybe what your next step should be. So um, are, is there anything in the works to, to fund a, a true universal three-tiered uh, system of support for school mental health? Um, I don't know. Uh, I know we're getting ready to have a social emotional learning framework rollout real soon from the PED, which will also be very helpful. And that's a component of this because that will look at tier one um, prevention and promotion. So I wish I could tell you something better or different. Um, Bruce is saying ask, ask a ratio of one to 250, which I want to chirp in is the maximum ratio. Um, not the average ratio, should be the maximum ratio. And I believe there is a formula for school nurses as well that it um, is reliant upon the health of the students. So um, we'll, we'll keep going and um, let you know a little bit more about this. Um, so what, what we'd like to do is poll you real quick and see what you think, what percentage you think your school mental health supports and services, what percentage of them are evidence-based. Evidence-informed, evidence-based, some people call them research-based or research-informed. Um, so if we could get that poll up and um, just in your current setting, whether that's at the district level or at the school level, what percentage of your school mental health supports and services do you think um, are currently evidence-based. Nope. Okay, we won't sit here too much longer. I don't want anybody's coffee to get cold. So it's something to think about. What am I doing? Um, I know I've been part of programs myself that I was working really hard to do something with youth in schools. And then when I got around to designing some way to measure what I was doing, I wasn't doing what I thought I was doing or I wasn't having the impact that I wanted to have. And um, it, even if you choose an evidence-based practice, it may not necessarily guarantee that you're gonna have the impact that you want, but you won't know that unless you actually measure it. So I encourage you to, to measure that using other than working just as hard as you can because that cannot be um, survival cannot be our, our default all the time that gets really exhausting you can find evidence to inform your practices there are registries there used to be a thing called nrep the national registry of evidence-based practices and programs that was from SAMHSA about three and a half years ago, and it was picked up 
mostly, most of it was picked up by the Suicide Prevention Resource Center um, and housed that data. And we're hoping that that'll eventually get to come back. You can look in the research literature, um, any of the, the developers that are working on things, any other schools. And, and really, if you think about it, if you decide to implement something that you've worked really hard on, make sure you measure it so you can show yourself and your school that this is an evidence-based practice. We found that this works and it's an evidence-based practice. Outside of peer-reviewed peer journals and universities, if you have implemented something and you measured it and it works, then for you it's an evidence-based practice and it could be duplicated, right? So um, we have, sometimes you hear in New Mexico that we talk about our, our terminal uniqueness that, that paralyzes us, that we're different, or staff is special, or our group of youth that we're working with are so different that I can't apply these things from outside that were developed other places that were so different. Um, whether that's culturally, whether that's because of the socioeconomic status of the majority of my school, um, the area I live, some folks are coming from frontier areas that a lot of the U.S. doesn't even understand what that means, and certainly a lot of the evidence-based pr practices and programs were not developed per se for frontier schools, so that's a real thing. But I just want to say, don't let that freeze you into feeling like you can't do anything. So even if even if you are implementing something that you designed, you came up with, make sure that you are looking for the evidence that it's working the way you think it is, um, and add that into your shape assessment when you fill it out to show that things have changed. We like to tell folks to fill out a baseline, get their baseline shape assessment report, and then once they implement some new things and try to address a few goals they create using that report then do it again and see what the difference was. And, and you're completely, totally in control of that, who you share it with, what you do with it. Oh, I guess I'm hearing now I'm crackling and I'm super spotty. So if Shana wants to take over, just um, interrupt. I'll keep going until you do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, it's torture to listen to somebody when it's not a good connection. So I apologize for that. I have everything in my universe turned off other than this connection, so not sure what's going on. So finding um, evidence-based practices, interventions, programs for schools, here are some that we got from our friends at the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, super long title. Um, these are some places to look at. These will be made available to you, so don't feel like you have to write them down. We'll make sure you get these. They're great places to look. And I think that one that was probably left off that I love, yeah, it's not on here. Um, there is the, is AIR. It's out of California. I have to look it up so I don't say it wrong. I thought it was on this slide. I wanna tell you the right thing. And Shana, if you can type it in the box for me. So AIR, it's the American Institutes for Research. And it's just www.air. Org are amazing. AIR is amazing and pretty much everything they do is, is federally funded so it's free but AIR has almost too much um, but if you're looking for something you can't find anywhere else go to AIR and uh, you will find it there for sure. So we just want to provide some more resources for you all and a lot of people have heard of Castle with SEL. Another great place to go. Not everything's free there but there's a lot of free stuff. And I say free that many times because I know what it's like to work somewhere where you just don't even have a budget to manage in the first place. Um, it's, it's a scientist school mental health. So all of this with a lens of cultural responsiveness and equity. Um, and this has been a part of MHTTC from the very beginning from their curriculum and obviously has been brought rightfully so to the forefront lately. But um, incorporating a responsiveness to cultural values within your school, within your community, within your district, the state, and, and knowing um, and asking, I think is even more important than knowing what, what you need to address, what's important to people, how you're perceived, how you perceive them. So um, ensuring that just because you're offering the same, to, same thing to everybody doesn't mean that everybody's receiving the same thing or viewing it the same way. So I'm, I'm going to leave that at that just for now. The, the recommendations um, is that we look at 
the mental health and well-being of all students. So not just those that come to us, not just those that knock on our door or sign up to see us, but we're looking at the well-being and mental health of all students. Um, some schools choose to do a screening in the same way that we do, well, current right now, we talk about temperature screenings, right? Maybe those are gonna be daily. So temperature screening, given this framework and somebody that wants a comprehensive school mental health program, if we're doing a temperature, what might we do for mental health? Um, and some folks are doing some really cool self-regulation check-ins at their schools. Some places do thumbs up, thumbs down, scale of one to 10, the happy face, frowny face, colors mark you know moving your marker to what color you're on that day walking in so you can communicate that more easily but if we're taking temperatures we're checking one portion of your physical health every single day and how important that is and that's saying that your temperature might be different tomorrow than it is today that goes almost without saying of course your temperature might be different so why would we not add to that an emotional piece a psychological piece mental health piece, asking somebody how they're doing today, right now. And then again, the next day, because what does that do? That creates a culture of, it's okay for me to know that some days I'm okay and some days I'm not, and that's gonna change. Somebody actually cares and is gonna ask me and I get in the habit of telling them how I'm doing. So it creates this culture, it's a, a subtle shift. Um, that I think we can add into some of the things that we're doing at our schools, these new behaviors that we're going to be doing for our schools. That can be done online too, that doesn't have to be in person. Um, I know in our department, we've just started that, where we do check-ins daily, and um, we, we ask each other how we're doing. And sometimes it's, my dog's funny, and sometimes it's, hey, I lost somebody in my family, and sometimes it's, I don't wanna talk right now. It's all different things, but it creates a culture that we can share, that somebody wants to know, and that we can share and should share. So um, that's just you know one example of looking at everybody in a universal way for mental health. Um, diverse and culturally competent faculty and staff, but the way that I was taught a long time sir, and so the most important way to proceed is to ask questions in a respectful kind of manner because we're not gonna memorize all the things about a culture, right? and we'll probably be wrong when we make assumptions. So um, just the way that we, we approach people. Um, uh, you can read on down that list. And the bottom one, the last bullet there, disaggregate key data points. Um, does anybody want to throw in the chat box what they think a key group to look at is or a key topic to look at would be? I should have had a coffee break for everybody. Does anybody have any, um, what, what do you typically, when you look at a data set of any kind, test scores, attendance, truancy, whatever, how do you break that down to look for themes? How do you break that down to figure out if, um, you know, a group's being more impacted or less impacted or um, something, you know, maybe you're maybe even not treating a group the same way you're treating another group. Typically in schools, you know, we look at grade level. Sometimes we look at gender for certain things. Sometimes we break it down by whatever the computer says. The student information system says is somebody's um, ethnicity in ways that make sense and maybe even in new ways that you haven't thought of. Making decisions. They need to be fair and not based on what somebody wants to do or is familiar with or is really excited about versus what is needed. Um, some data sources in schools are common there on the right side where a lot of us are familiar with those. Uh, don't be, don't feel like you can't go outside your district to get some of this data. There are some national databases that you can look at and they'll break it down um, maybe even down to your school level, sometimes your districts don't even know about them, but actually not just looking at the aggregate total. Um, students were absent. Okay, well, what do the students look like? What, 
what, what kind of student was going on this particular day versus this particular day. You know the drill, okay? Um, crisis incidents and crisis response, crisis and trauma behavior and response. Um, sometimes we're so tired after those that we don't want to look at them. They're very important to look at, right? Um, office referrals, suspensions, those, those are big ones to break down and really take a look at those and see what we're doing and then making fair objective decisions about that. So these are the core features of the MHTTC Comprehensive School Mental Health Model Curriculum Framework. We call it all those things, but these are the core features that are measured and that you address. And then these align perfectly with the resource library that's available once you complete your shape assessment. So this is the, this is what you're actually, and there are several questions for each one of these bullet points. It's, it's lengthy, I'm not gonna lie. It's gonna take a little bit of time and it's gonna take a team. But we know an elementary school team of, I think it was about six people, did it over um, Google chat, I believe, completed the entire shape assessment over just a couple of one hour long meetings, were able to combine their answers and all give input because nobody knows everything that's going on in a school. And they were able to answer all the questions associated with these and generate a report. The short version of the report, and Shana, tell me if I'm wrong here, but the short version of the report, I think is around 10 pages. And then there's a longer one where each core component has 10 to 20 pages. So it's extensive and that's a lot of questions. Super duper helpful. And it gives you a rating in each area. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, so again, I know this is huge. I know it is a lot to take in. Victoria referenced our trip to Maryland when we got our 600 page binder and it was overwhelming, absolutely. The biggest thing that I want to remind you all at this point, and then we'll go over a little bit of the value of comprehensive school mental health, is that this curriculum is made to fit you where you're at instead of you fitting it. So instead of thinking that you've got to start from page one and go to page 600, you don't. Um, remember that shape assessment. Remember taking the things that we have, evaluating it, making data-based decisions, data-driven decisions, to make what you have going on in your school work really well and identify areas where you may need to enhance a little bit. And that's the, that's the purpose of this curriculum. So again, you may be feeling overwhelmed at this point. Another check-in um, that we're here to help. <clears throat> so the value of comprehensive school mental health. Why is providing mental health support and services in schools important? You're all rolling your eyes at me right now, going, yeah, well, duh, we know it's important, right? So let's talk about this a little bit more. Next slide. I know we had a question earlier um, in regards to the PED social emotional learning curriculum. You may be familiar with this wheel um, within the CASEL model um, talking about the areas of social emotional learning. So which one skill, think about this in your mind, you can type in the chat box if you want, which one skill would you wish for all graduating students to possess? If you think about your new graduating class, what one skill, and I would love for you to type some of those skills in the chat box. What skill would you want every student in your new graduating class to possess? Self-awareness. Self-management, reasonable decision-making, absolutely. Self-management again, compassion towards self, social awareness, self-awareness, reasonable decision-making, absolutely. Relationships and other skills that are required, thank you. So, and definitely feel free to keep typing those in the box if you want. Although there is a great emphasis on academic skills in school, when we ask, when we think about those skills that are important for graduating students, most people identify social emotional competencies as a priority, right? So we're not saying those academics aren't important, but all of those things that you all are typing in the chat box right now, those are social emotional competencies, right? This wheel is from the Collaborative of Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, and reflects the five domains of social emotional learning, which you see up there. Um, not only is the development of positive mental health and socially emotionally competent students part of the mission of schools, but we also want to improve their mental health, social emotional competency, which in turn we know improves their academic performance, right? So 
And Bruce just put in the chat box, academics have SEL in them when done well. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Everything connects together. And that's really when we talk about integrated school health. You do not have to have health in your title. You don't have to be a school nurse. You don't have to be a school, uh, a school counselor. Where, wherever we are, we're all affecting the mental health of our students. So in addition to mental health promotion, we know that schools are the primary mental health service provider for students with identified needs, right? So you see up here, 60 to 80% of children who receive mental health services do so in schools. To me, when I first joined this team, I come out of the world of residential treatment centers and corrections. That was, that was huge for me. That was a really big eye opener for me. 20% of the students receive some form of school mental health services annually. That's a low number, right? Um, we know that mental health challenges often first emerge in school and school-based services are often more accessible and less stigmatizing than other community mental health services. Let's look a little bit about the impact of school mental health. There's a growing data to support the accessibility and impact of school mental health. Students who, we know that students who participate in social emotional learning programs do better academically and socially than those that don't. And back to Bruce's comment, right? We know that when we're looking for those academic outcomes or improved attendance or, you know, decreased discipline or whatever it is, we know that that starts out with the social emotional wellness of that individual. Positive school climate and social emotional learning improves school safety, decreases bullying, right? We get a lot of questions all of the time, or we get asked to do presentations about bullying, which we absolutely do. But we always try to bring those folks who are asking for those presentations or trainings back to the root of the issue of, yes, absolutely, we'll come and do a training. That being said, let's look at the big picture, right? Let's look at the root of the issue and let's, let's hit the root of the issue instead of just trying to hit it at the end, right? We wanna be proactive. In addition to schools being the place where most students receive mental health services, youth are six times more likely to complete mental health treatment in schools and other community settings. We're um, with a grant that we hold right now through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, we're looking at those barriers to youth receiving mental health care outside of schools. How do we bridge that gap? How do we identify what those barriers are to receiving care and help overcome those, those barriers? And we see here that a big part of that barrier is providing those mental health services right there in the schools. So within that, when comprehensive school mental health systems are put in place, the research suggests students receive all of these things, right? We see improvements in social self and social awareness and I saw some of that on your goals of what you would like your senior class to have. Decision-making capacity, relationship skills. You guys are on the ball. You've got all of those, right? Better academic outcomes, fewer special ed referrals and a decrease for needs for restrictive placements, discipline, fewer disciplinary actions and increased student engagement. These are all things that we want to see for our students. As administrators, as teachers, wherever we sit within that school, these are things that we want to see for our district, for our school, and for our students. So taking on something like this curriculum feels huge, right? But we know that these are outcomes that we think about every single day, and we wish for, and we work towards, and we, we bust as much as we can every single day to try to get to these outcomes. We know that implementing this curriculum ultimately and enhancing your school mental health program within your school or your district is going to affect these outcomes in a positive way. Next slide. So quick district example here and again I'll reference the top right hand of the slide where it says resources. Boston Public Schools Comprehensive School Behavioral Health Model you'll see and yes it's another triangle we like triangles. Um, guided by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, Boston Public Schools uses this comprehensive behavioral health model. Um, their mission is to ensure that all students have safe and supportive school where they can be successful. The model, based on what they call the lighthouse, which as an East Coaster, I relate to that, right? Um, but another form of the, the loved triangle. Um, is a three-tiered model of service delivery. Their model integrates behavioral health screenings, positive skill instruction, including social emotional learning for all students, that tier one that Victoria talked to you about. This model also actively promotes family and community partnership as part of their work. 
within the curriculum, within the resources, and hopefully you all found it within the link, or if you haven't, we're here to help. These district examples go into depth about, look at this district, this is how they implement it in each one of those areas, and it goes over that in depth. We also have links to the district specifically, and the, the curriculum is really meant to be able to let you learn from what other folks have done. So those links are there. Please, I encourage you to look at those district examples and reach out to them and say, hey, how did this work for you? Thank you, Victoria, for putting that link up in the box. Um, another example, thank you. We have Wisconsin School Mental Health Initiative. Um, several states, including Wisconsin, have developed the framework or guidance for districts on the components of comprehensive school mental health. Within Wisconsin, they um, had got three fairly large grants being awarded in 2015. Um, one of those is an AWARE grant, uh, Safe and Healthy Schools grant, um, and a couple others. Within there, they braided those fundings to impact and utilize this curriculum in over 100 schools in the state to receive mental health professional development, technical assistance, um, a state management team and community managing team to help advance their strategic mental health development in their school. Um, they really went on, again, another triangle, right? We like triangles. This one has a beautiful farm in the background, making it work for them. Within these grants, they braided that funding to be able to implement this framework. And I want to bring you back to, I believe it's the seventh module, which talks about funding. Yes, this is a free curriculum, but we want to dream big, right? There are things that we may want to do for our district or school that may require funding. We may need another FTE or a few or whatever that looks like. This curriculum talks you through ways to be able to get that funding. And again, we're happy to support you in that. Um, I believe this is the last state example, Colorado, our neighbor's school mental health toolkit. Um, phenomenal toolkit. This is a blueprint that Colorado uses for their school mental health services, a tool for community members, school, local leaders, and districts. And they include those 10 best practices, including strategies for implementing funding and sustaining mental health services within schools. This is huge. We don't want a grant to come in, pump some money into our state, and then at, when five years is over, we lose that funding, right? So we really look at not only funding, but sustainability, and Colorado is a great example of that. So we've got a couple minutes. I think we've got time to do this. We're going to go into breakout rooms. And yes, this is short because I know we ended 1115 and we want to respect everybody's times. We just dumped all of this information on you, right? And I really want, hope that you all are super motivated and excited to go back virtually to your district, to those leaders to say, hey, I learned about this curriculum. I think this is something we should look into. I think we should do the shape assessment. Why not, right? Um, so taking that motivation, what I want you to do is get into your breakout rooms and talk about what is your specific goal for your district and what, what are your action steps? What are your to-dos, right? Is it send an email to this person and include the link? Is it talk to Shana and Victoria about doing a presentation for our school board or what have you? What is the to-do that you can then take back to your district, okay? So we're gonna take maybe three, four minutes. And if you will, um, Veronica, if you'll go ahead and put everybody into our breakout rooms. All right, so I hope you all, and I know that was a very short time, um, but then I hope you all had a chance to think about what your next steps are, um, what that looks like for you, who we can talk to. I heard a lot of folks, especially in my breakout room, uh, talking about the shape assessment, which is wonderful. And I want to remind you of that. That's your starting place, right? Remember with those data-driven decisions, we want to figure out where are we right now? How do we measure where we're at? And with the shape assessment, you can do that. Um, and that's a really great thing. And again, I, I also put it in the chat box and reminded a couple other folks as well. We've been asked um, at the di district level to present to school boards, to present to administration about this curriculum. We're here to support you in any way. And how we can do that, you just let us know and we'll do our best to support you in that. So um, just a reminder again, where can you find this curriculum? You have the website there, um, it's in the chat box. We can put it up again, the mhttcnetwork.org. When you go into there, you'll go to the resources tab and go all the way to the bottom, which is school mental health resources. And it's got a couple different curriculums there. It's the second one down um, and you can click there and it'll download 
the whole curriculum. Um, remember that the shape assessment is a separate link. It's a separate website, but those resources are intertwined together. Um, I know you've got a poll up there on your screen. I appreciate you doing that. I want to take just a second to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, you should have a QR code up on your screen. We put out out of the Office of School and Adolescent Health a quarterly newsletter if you're interested in free trainings, how we can support you, what services we can offer. We really encourage you to subscribe to that newsletter, contact us, let us know how we can help you. And if you scan that QR code right there on your screen, you can um, subscribe to the newsletter right there. Um, so again, I really just wanna thank you all so much for taking the time to sit with us today to learn about this curriculum and to attend SHEI. So thank you again. And you, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day and a great conference. Thank you so much.